Hello and welcome to an overview of chapter eight in the SEO strategies and skills courseware. Today we're going to talk about site structure and keyword mapping. This follows an overview of chapter seven, where I talked about keyword development and research and how to select one. So if you have not watched that video already, be sure to check back uh, earlier in the course and uh, view that before re-watching this. So today we're going to talk about taking those keywords that you've already developed and thought through and figured out how they're going to fit together um, within a site. So this chapter is going to look at how sites are developed in terms of hierarchy, as well as how the keywords are going to fit in there on each page. Now, I would recommend also reading this chapter. It's very fast, um, but there are some technicalities that you want to make sure to understand. And so I'm going to go through kind of some of the hiccups that you could uh, hit as you go through this. I think section one is pretty straightforward, why you need to use keyword mapping within your site structure. The one element that they don't really expand upon here is if you look at this image here, the different themes for, say, Olive Garden's uh, SEO strategy is that they don't explain the difference between a keyword such as pasta restaurant and pasta near me. And the reason is the whole, and there's a chapter later in the course, course or about this on local SEO, but the whole near me thing where you see these two words together here, you know, that's not a keyword that you need to worry about and that you should be optimizing. Trying to work, trying to fit the words near me into a website just doesn't make sense. And uh, Google has already set up their algorithm so that when you search pasta near me, it's going to immediately look at your location. The near me is going to trigger, you know, what's closest. What's the closest pasta restaurant? That is near the searcher's location. And it's going to use, uh, you know, pasta as a keyword that it's going to be looking for. So that's what the, that's how the near me works. Now, you also want to think about all these other pieces here. Um, the gist of this first section is that, you know, if you determine that these are your themes your, for your keywords and you come up with all these different keyword phrases, um, the short of it is that you don't want to have a page for every single keyword phrase, but you also don't just want to have one page. You know, there's lots of one page websites out there, but in reality, you're going to like the idea of keyword mapping is to cluster certain keywords together that are similar and would be searched by the same people. If we look back to the last chapter, we talked a lot about searcher intent. You want to make sure that your content on your website is providing the people that are searching your keyword phrase of proper value and getting them what they're looking for. Google will penalize you if that's not the case. And really, it's just, you know, you don't want to bring in a bunch of traffic that ends up immediately leaving, uh, which also occurs when there is a mismatch between the searcher's intent and the keywords that they are looking for. Now, if we keep scrolling down, another piece I do want to mention on section one is the idea of um, this last big paragraph here. In the next couple sections, are going to break this down, but really what you're going to be doing is that um, search and the last sentence search engines modify search results to match intent this means uh, similar to the near me search engines know when you're searching for something that isn't really a keyword and that is things like near me um, if you're searching something that's approximate to another keyword like for example if we scroll back up like pasta places near me pasta restaurants near me like those have different volumes of search, but they're essentially looking for the same thing. The difference between pasta places near me and pasta restaurant near me, like you don't have to optimize for both of those. You don't even have to, like you can just optimize for one of those. And really, as long as you have the other elements of your website well put together and optimized, it doesn't matter if you don't, like you could put, you could completely ignore the word places in your entire website. And as long as you have the pasta restaurant piece, it's the search engine's going to know what a place is 
and how to match that up to your pasta restaurant keyword optimization. So I just wanted to say that um, up front before we go any further. <clears throat> now, uh, before we get into the keyword mapping any further, I do want to talk about site structure. This is one technical aspect of the of your website uh, discussion and the you know the the website terminology in this course, but I think this is pretty easy. You want to make sure that first off, you know, websites you you don't want your structure. And when I talk structure, this is what I'm talking about. How are the pages connected to one another? Right now, if you go to, um, let's say, I don't know, come up with an example. If you go to any any of your favorite sports team, their their website, you go to the website and it's whatever.com. If you then go to the roster or the schedule or um, you know anything else, sponsors, um, stats, anything like that, it's going to be the team name.com slash that page. So you have you know one page and then a page that lives right under it in terms of the URL. Things get dicey when you start putting too many pages underneath in multiple levels. So you could have, you know, an example could be, okay, you know, my favorite team is the, we'll say the Detroit Pistons, you know, this is the Pistons homepage. And then underneath, say we'll have the roster. Okay, that's fine. I want to look at a player. Um, I want to look at Cade Cunningham. He's one of the star players for the team. Okay, you look at his um, profile page. Then underneath, you could have another page. It might go into more detail about his history, his statistics, anything like that. Right in a section, in a page like that, in a site like that, it makes sense because um, you know you're not going too deep, and not a lot of people are going to be looking for things that are way down here. It gets dicey though when you are going to be looking at like an e-commerce website where things are sold and down here, you're going to look at kind of how a typical e-commerce site works. You have your homepage, you have your categories. So say you're selling candles, right? Maybe types of candles, maybe you have um, uh, tall candles, scented candles, and mm, another type of candle, fake candles, we'll say. <laughs> candles that are really just electric. Then underneath, you're going to have subcategories. Or maybe under the scented candles, you're going to have pumpkin or seasonal category, seasonal candles, um, you know, sweet smelling candles, things like that. And then you have all the products and then all the versions of the product. So that gets deep really fast. Um, now, when you also think about that, you're going to want to make sure that you are optimizing all of these pages based on not just the title of the product, right on the product side, but also the non-branded keyword that you want people to search and eventually find for your product. So if you are selling a, a candle that is scented like a chocolate chip cookie, you're not going to want to be optimizing for the brand name. You're going to want to be optimizing for, you know, cookie scented candles, sweet scented candles, things like that, that people will land on your product page. That's just an example of how the site structure works. The problem is if you get into these SKUs, for example, you could be so far down in terms of the structure that you may not be able, search engines might not make it all the way here to crawl and index that lowest level. When you think about one thing to can, to remember here is that from an SEO standpoint, it's best to have all your pages available within three to four clicks of the home page. That's the page depth. But then also, if you think about how uh, a crawler looks at your website, it's not going to go more than you know three or four layers deep. So when you go down here, you know you also want to make sure that the way that you are optimizing your pages is in line with the content that's there. So. We talked about candles as a category. If I talk about electric candles, that needs to be the search term here that you're optimizing your category page for. Then as you get into a subcategory, say you want to use, um, you know, daylight color. I'm thinking of like light bulb colors. You have daylight, you have warm light, and you have like, I don't know, black candles or something. Um, black light candles. 
those are all the subcategories. And so that you would optimize those appropriately. And then you can get even more specific and more niche for each individual product. So the idea with e-commerce sites, again, as you go down a layer and really for any site, as you go deeper into the website, so too must, I mean, you also have to get deeper with your keywords and more niche with what it is that you are optimizing for. Um, they do have a note down here about non-branded versus branded keywords. I talked about in the last chapter how non-branded keywords are really the only thing you want to be considering for keyword selection. And, you know, there are some situations, as they outline here, when you would want to use branded keywords. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm, you know, I'm not going to call, I'm not going to look at any of these exceptions on an exam. I'm not going to like be look. I would never really look to branded keywords myself if I was developing an SEO strategy for a business like this. But I will say, if, if your brand is starting from zero and, or you have any competitors out there, um, you may want to go for some branded keywords. Um, and actually, actually, if you're not starting from zero, the lower you're starting, you know, if you're starting from zero, then you don't want to use branded keywords because people aren't going to search that. It, but if people are familiar with the brand, it's a name brand, it's a household name. It's kind of like one in the same with a non-brand. Like, I don't know if you use Kleenex. Well, that's a brand. Kleenex is a brand. It's not just, a, it's not just a synonym for tissue. Um, kind of like, what's another example? Um, some people talk, talk about Coca-Cola as just a generic word for all pop slash soda. So that's another thing like, oh, I'll have a Coke. Um, oh, okay. What kind of Coke? And then like, it's a Southern thing. So if you want to think about that too, you know, the brand, you can do branded keywords in these scenarios, but you need to make sure that it's a brand that is being used so much that um, it, like people would already search that. I just wanted to give that as a, a heads up. Now, now we have the website taxonomy thing. Um, we've talked about the levels and how we organize and classify content with that last candle e-commerce example. Um, they talk about shoes as the example in this section. Really, that's what taxonomy is, is how, like how you are actually going to be organizing and breaking down the levels of pages on the website. Now, you know, the, I will say um, this paragraph here is pretty important. You know, remember, remember that failing to account for these different classifications means you're probably missing out on some traffic. Now, um, this is where, we, where it can get a little bit tricky. You know, there's a lot of different searches out there. There's a lot of different ways that people are going to search for non-branded terms. And I want to go back to the e-commerce side here. You know, if you sell shoes like they do, or you sell candles, like the example that I just kind of came up with a couple of minutes ago, you want to make sure you want your site to appear for every permutation of uh, keywords that come up for anything related to your product. And how do you do that? There's so many different varieties. Well, it does start with keyword research, but you also want to make sure that you are looking at the proper um the proper things that could go into that in terms of like, what's the search volume, um, what actually matches what you are selling and, you know, what is, um, what's something that is actually reasonable, you know, like if we go back to the pasta places thing, like you're not going to have to optimize for both pasta places and pasta restaurant, right? You pick one, the, S, the search engine will handle the other. Now, um, Faceted navigation here, definition, it's just using the filter. And when you do, when you filter products, like you can filter on Amazon, for example, really easily. Um, it then creates a page for every single combination of the based on the filter that you select. Um, that's something that you want to avoid here because while it is user friendly, um, it is not search engine friendly. Not saying that you can have filters on your website or on an e-commerce website at all but you just don't want them to yield completely new web pages as a result. And this is more of an older, 
older website trick where you would click filters and then a new page would render. Typically with filters, you are getting now a page that is dynamic and it's not one that search engines are going to be able to crawl and index. So not really a concern today. Um, just something that I did want to call out in terms of like what it is, uh, why it matters here. Now, um, you know, the big thing here is how do you, how do you comp, how do you manage the complex re keyword research? So, um, they then get into some stair examples, a staircase company, and then there's a spreadsheet with all these different things. So here's, here's how I break it down. One, there's three elements that you go into keyword research, keyword research on an e-commerce site usually ends up with you researching a ton of keywords. There are all these different variations of all the different products, categories, sub products, brands that you come up with, um, all the different benefits, all the different you know elements, all the different types that are possible. There's all these different columns that are looked at here. The way I look at it is, look, there's three big things. What is, what is the keyword, right? Start with, um, I would say one or two word keywords and then make them more niche going all the way down to as specific as you can get. And then from there, you want to look at the search volume, which is column L here, right? That is very important. But then from there, you also want to use the frequency. That is how many times, like how, on how many different pages um, on your site would this keyword phrase appear? Or how many different products do you have? Those are the three most important things. All these other columns are just good organizational pieces that can help, help you differentiate the different products and the different combinations that go into something like a staircase builder like this. Now, the way I look at it too, I mean, those are nice because then you can make sure that you, you hit everything. Great. But at the same time, you know, sure, if you're working on a business like this, that has this many different products and this many different services, um, you know, there's, you shouldn't be, first off, you shouldn't be using an Excel spreadsheet for something like this. This is going to be something a little bit more, um, a little bit more expansive, a little bit more cost time consuming, and there's gotta be a lot more strategy going into it. Using something like Excel is good for companies that have like, I don't know, five products across a couple different categories where you can easily break down all the different keywords that go into it. Um, I do know some SEO companies that still use Excel like this and where they're breaking down all these different permutations. Um, and I can say there are a lot of tools out there that will do a lot of this for you. So, um, you know, I don't think you're, you shouldn't ever have to do something that's quite this intense. Now, let's say you did do that. Um, first off, the search volume is important because you're not going to want to optimize for things that have a search of search volume of zero or 10, 10, 20, 30, um, at, at you know, niche, uh, long tail keywords are important. But when your search volume is almost null, there's no point in spending that kind of time, right? You see all these high search volumes here. That's great, whatever. Um, but there does need to be a cutoff for you when you say, okay, I think this is too much. I, I think there's just not enough searches here. Now, from there, you're going to want to look at the different, um, I'm going on step three. Um, think about pivot tables here. Don't worry about the pivot tables in this chapter. I'm not gonna, you know, there's not Excel should your uh, skills with Excel should not like SEO should not be dependent on Excel skills. SEO needs to be dependent on SEO skills, which this chapter tends to get bogged down in, which is why I am creating a video on this. So you want to create, look at your keywords here and, um, you know, you can probably guess why these various rows were eliminated. Why were these keywords eliminated? Staring contest, nothing related to the products of stairs. Stairway to heaven, no. Define, no. Like, these are all not things. Another thing, though, look at the volume. 10, 10, 20. Um, maybe, you know, neither, these are all really low volume, too, and low frequency. 
as well. So, you know, they had set a threshold, a search volume threshold. I wouldn't set a search volume threshold of 500. I think that volume is still fine, but whatever. But they set a threshold based on volume and frequency, and that's why these were all eliminated. Or you could just use the eye test and be like, oh, obviously I am not going to use these because there's no point. There's the search intent does not at all match what I am selling. Now, if you got on to SEO step four, you want to think about um, how exactly you're going to, like, what else can you do with these keywords? Are there other keyword opportunities for creating other content? And when you look at an e-commerce site, that is important because you don't just want to focus on the products and the categories and the subcategories, but you also want to figure out, all right, how can I optimize the other elements of our site that we can start bringing in some traffic? We're not going to get into that today, but just know that um, having all these different keywords has benefits outside of the e-commerce platform. Then we're into step five, which is the map. This is the keyword mapping part. This is the final piece of the of kind of the overview in this chapter. So, you know, here we have, um, and they came up with five keywords, for example, and that they had three here that are going to one URL and two keywords that are going to another URL. So if you look at the difference here, you have, I mean, it's pretty obvious why these are grouped as they are. Steel stairs, steel staircase, steel, steel stairway, all very, very, very similar. Here, steel staircase railing, railing for steel stairs, right? It's pretty much the same keyword, just backwards, whatever. Yes, they work with the with those same URLs. But then it gets a little bit tricky. And I don't know why they switched over to fitness trackers here. I think that's okay, though. Now you're getting into, okay, it's not as easy as just you know, reversing the word choice. But now, what if people are actually using different words? So you see like fitness tracker for swimming, fitness tracker. Um, let me see a couple examples. Like fitness tracker for swimming versus fitness tracker waterproof. Are those going to be the same intent? Are those very different? And if so, if are they different? And as this, as this page will tell you, you know, probably not. You don't want to overthink the, uh, the the idea of keywords here. You want to think about okay, like if I'm searching key uh, fitness tracker waterproof, maybe I'm going to be running outside in the in the rain. Okay, that that could be possible. Now, what I would say here is, um, you know, your keywords when you are looking at a breakdown of all these different words, all these different keywords, is it's then time to group them together in terms of what they could realistically lead to. So you need to, you know, take a look at, okay, we'll start with the fitness tracker for swimming. That's pretty, um, pretty niche, right? It's not just fitness tracker. It's not just, it's not a fitness tracker for men. It's not an app. It's not reviews. It's for an activity, fitness tracker for swimming specifically. So what goes with that fitness tracker swimming? Yes. Fitness tracker waterproof there. I wouldn't go with fitness tracker for cycling because that's a different activity. And while, um, you know, if it's the same product for the two of them, okay, great. Then group them together. If it's not, then I would keep them separate, but also those are very different things that people are looking for. And so while those are probably, they may go to the same product, that's where you have different SKUs. And then you also want to make sure that your pages are going to be sharing content that are uh, more for the specific search. And as you scroll down here, you see more detail into this. Um, here's the piece that I had mentioned before. Um, you know, example two, realistically, no, the products needed is the same because of the context. Um, and actually I really like what the author said here. You can make sure that fitness tracker swimming and fitness tracker waterproof lead to the same intent by doing something like making sure there's not too much page imagery focused on swimming if you know that some are others are coming to use the product for a different purpose. I think that is a really key statement here. Even if your full intention with this fitness tracker is to use during swimming, 
but then you realize people are coming to your site because they're looking for waterproof fitness trackers and not for swimming. Um, you found a new audience. It's just a good business general marketing tool. Okay, I should probably take that photo of that swimmer off and or maybe take that second photo off so that now I have one of the swimmer and one of somebody running in the rain. So now I am appeasing both groups and I see a different audience coming to my site and like, oh yes, that's what I'm looking for. And then they can go and purchase it. Your product's the same. Your language is the same. The messaging's the same. The only difference is that you change one photo, one image, so that it is better appealing to this new audience that you have found coming to your site. Last piece I want to mention, though, as we wrap up here, um, you know, what are what are some other best practices? One, group keywords together that suggest the same level of specificity, right? That's good. Um, you know, say you only have say your fitness tracker for cycling, waterproof, and swimming are all the same. I think that's okay, right? That's It's all going to go to the same product page. So then how would you make those the same? Similar to what we did, talked about with the waterproof one. Maybe you then have a three image banner, one that has a swimmer, one that has a runner in the rain, and then one that has somebody on a bike. That way you are also capturing that third group, the fitness tracker for cycling. And it may be the lowest search volume, but at the same time, the lower the search volume, the more likely you are to get a higher per percentage of the people that are actually searching that term. If anything, I would say the fitness tracker for cycling piece is, is really important because um, you're probably ranking higher for that because of the lower search. And there's probably a lot, um, probably not as difficult to rank so high. The keyword difficulty level is not going to be quite as crazy as it would be for fitness tracker or swimming. Definitely not the same as something like just fitness trackers in general. Now, one other thing I do want to say is, um, you know, they call out these, these bullet points here are a little hidden. So I do just want to mention them. One, avoid branded keywords that we can't win, right? Fitness tracker, Amazon, don't bother with that. Just get rid of it. Um, Avoid keywords that aren't relevant. Maybe there's no app, right? Maybe they are, maybe they're not looking for reviews. Maybe it's like, hey, if I want, if I'm looking for fitness tracker reviews, I mine probably shouldn't come up first. I mean, generally it should, but you know, maybe I don't have a comparison chart. Get rid of it. Maybe I don't track blood pressure. That's kind of hard to do with a fitness tracker on a wrist. You know, maybe I, I'm not gonna bother with that. Well, it's nice to try and appease all of these people and bring in all of these traffic, you don't want people coming to your site and not finding what they're looking for. Finally, you want to get rid of, um, you, or you want to create the keyword map itself. And that's what this lower section is about. That is doing this. Um, start with the mapped URL. What is the page? Usually it's a product or it's a category. Then go in and connect the keywords that you're going to then have connect to that URL. So the way that this example has here, you have fitness tracker, watch fitness tracker and watch and fitness tr and fit those two going to the watch page. You only ended up with one on the heart rate page, but then you did end up with two on the bands right at the bottom of this table. You have fitness bands and fitness tracker bracelet very different keywords, but they're kind of looking for the same thing. As a result, you can map both of those to the bands URL. Now, you know, there's some really good benefits here. I think the number one thing is keyword cannibalization. I mentioned this last time, and it will be, um, you know, I'm a big proponent of making sure that people don't do this, but um, keyword cannibalization is if you optimize multiple pages for the same keywords, you're going to end up um, competing with yourself. And sometimes Google will penalize you and then you won't rank for either of them. So this way you're putting all of the keywords out in one area and you are you're connecting them all or mapping them, if you will, to a different URL on your site. So that's really important. Also, the last point is, is key because the last uh, chapter, I talk a lot about search intent and how SEO is more of a search intent led activity these days. It's not just about driving meaningless traffic, but it helps to ensure that our website structure is created um, by the interests of the searchers, not just what we think. Again, 
you go back to the idea of the fitness tracker for swimming. Okay, I have, I've made a fitness, if you've made a fitness tracker that's ideal for swimming, and that's what you have optimized uh, your pages for, but then suddenly you're seeing people are coming to your site because they're looking for waterproof fitness trackers, right? That's a new audience. And you're now being led by the interest of the searchers. You would have never found that if it was just, you know, based on your own hunch, but you looked at the analytics, you looked at the SEO and you realized, oh, hey, we're bringing in people that are actually searching for a very different type of product. And it's not that they're searching for a different product. They are searching for, the, for my product, but they're thinking of it through a different lens, which is perfectly fine. I mean, this is how you see success in a lot of businesses because they're able to reach an audience that may not have been their initial target. So as a result, you end up seeing more success, more sales, more traffic. And this is really made possible because of all the keyword research you've done and the mapping to the various pages. Um, and really, that's about it. You know, there's some key takeaways that the key takeaways that they put at the end of this page, which I really like. You know, there's a lot of research and effort that goes into site taxonomy. Um, keywords do need to be organized and categorized. And when you think about what the final URL is going to be, and there's um, Later, the next chapter goes into content optimization and like, okay, we have our keywords, we've map, mapped in the pages, what comes next? That is what the next chapter is for, um, which is going to be a really critical piece in the course, especially as it pertains to um, any future work that you do with businesses or anything in the real world. But, um, you know, I digress. Really, the data that comes together from all of this keyword research is going to inform not only the page titles and the site structure and the URLs, but it could really help change your business and transform it into something that um, connects with a whole new target audience. And anybody that's taking this class has already taken a fair share of marketing principles, probably some content marketing content, uh, courses. And you know that you can segment target and position your brand all you want. But uh, you never know how many different audiences and how many different niches are really desiring your product or your service until you put it out there and that you see how people are actually coming to your, your product page and your website. So um, just wanted to leave you with that. Um, and with that, that wraps up overview of chapter eight in the SEO strategies and skills. Um, I hope I helped shed a little bit of light on this and um, helped inform you a little bit on how to do keyword mapping um, and taking a better look at site structure. So um, I will be back next time with another chapter and um, best of luck.